We are very pleased today during this celebration of the B-Day to welcome special guests from all around the world and to celebrate together in this special webinar, UNESCO and Gerla Women for Bees, learning from beekeepers in biosphere reserves. The UNESCO Man and the Biosphere Program and Gerla are cooperating to train and support 50 women beekeepers within the World Network of Biosphere Reserves. This five-year program is part of the partnership initiated between UNESCO MAP program and LVMH. The objectives of the MAP program, which celebrate this year 50th anniversary, are to reconcile conservation of biodiversity with its sustainable use and promote solutions and sustainable practices all around the world in every ecosystems. The program Women for Bees focuses on three main areas. Cross training of women beekeepers in biosphere reserves that can share their expertise, knowledge, know-how. The creation of a world network of women beekeepers that will be supporting each other and also supported scientifically and technically. And also the connection between their work and the analysis and measurement of the benefits of pollination for the local ecosystems. This program focuses specifically on local practices in biosphere reserves. And we want to share with you today a dialogue between experts, scientists, and real practic practitioners. And before we do that, I'm very happy to give the floor to Her Excellence, Madame Medka Ipavitz, Ambassador Extraordinary Plenipotentiary of the Republic of Slovenia to France, Permanent Delegate to UNESCO. Dear friends of bees, today is the 20th of May and Slovenia and the rest of the world are celebrating World Bee Day for the fourth time. As a permanent delegate of Slovenia to UNESCO, I am very proud to inform you that I it was on the initiative of my country that the UN General Assembly unanimously proclaimed World Bee Day on 20th December 2017. It is the result of cooperation between the Slovenian Beekeepers Association as the initiator, the Republic of Slovenia and the UN Food and Agriculture Organization that gained wider international support. The main purpose of celebrating the World Bee Day is to raise awareness among the international public about the importance of bees and other pollinators for humanity in the light of food security and care for the environment and biodiversity. It is important to add that this initiative also contributes to the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. You might ask, but why Slovenia? Beekeeping is part of our rich historical and cultural heritage that demonstrates our close connection to nature and care for its conservation. The Slovenian beekeeping tradition is also strongly rooted in people's consciousness. Among every thousand citizens of Slovenia, four people are beekeepers, which is unique in the world. The most important figure of Slovenian beekeeping is Anton Janša, who in the 18th century laid the foundation of modern beekeeping. It is Janša's birthday, 20 May, that was declared World Bee Day. Due to bees, Slovenia is becoming known as a green, active and healthy tourist destination, as well as center for epitourism. Slovenian beekeepers are making every effort to ensure that young generations are aware of the importance of beekeeping. For many years, Children have been served a traditional honey breakfast in schools, which also includes lessons on the importance of pollinators. This has spread across the borders of Slovenia in many European countries and beyond. Slovenia is also the first member state of European Union to protect bees by law. With this year World Bee Day, we once again wish to draw attention to the fact 
that the bees are extremely important for our survival and that they are critically endangered in many countries and regions. Raising the awareness is a priority that needs to be addressed on a permanent basis. The main theme of this year's celebration is Be Engaged, Building Back Better for Bees. That is also the topic of UN Food and Agriculture Organization Conference, where Slovenia is actively participating. It is an excellent opportunity to raise awareness of how everyone can make a difference to support, restore and enhance the role of pollinators. UNESCO Assistant Director Ms. Shamila Ner Baduele has already introduced the importance of the UNESCO program Women for Bees in collaboration with Guerlain and French Observatory of Apodology. As a woman, I am very proud that Slovenia and Slovene female beekeepers are part of UNESCO Guerlain program Women for Bees because it will not only contribute to the objectives set by our initiative but also give a support to female beekeepers across the globe and empower them through sustainable professional activity. Let me conclude with this year World Bee Day call. Now is the time to rethink how we relate to nature and pollinators and what actions we can take to support these tiny hard workers and the millions of livelihoods they in turn support. Thank you very much. And now I have the pleasure to give the floor for some opening remarks from Cécile Lochard, Chief Sustainability Officer at Guerlain. Happy World Bee Day, everyone. I am Cécile Lochard, Chief Sustainability Officer of Guerlain, and I'm glad to share with you today on what is for our house one of the most crucial subjects of its sustainability journey, bee preservation. At the heart of Guerlain's purpose, we placed indeed nature regeneration and bees, and it was more than 10 years ago now that we decided to officiate bee preservation as a strategic pillar of our commitments. Our urgency to act for bees echo the realities that this guardian of biodiversity faces, and because they play the essential role of pollination, we know that we owe them so much. In this perspective, Guerlain is pleased to cooperate with the UNESCO Man and the Biosphere Programme for conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. Together, we are joining forces for the next five years with the programme Women for Bees. These programmes aim to empower women beekeepers in biosphere reserves around the world and support them in their activities. The programme has three objectives. First, to enable cross-training and knowledge exchange for 50 women beekeepers from 25 biosphere reserves. Secondly, to create a global network for women beekeepers, providing technical support and ensuring that their beekeeping activities are developed in a sustainable way. And finally, to advance knowledge and pollination and the interactions between human and biodiversity. With UNESCO, the Women for Bees program will be able to develop cross trainings in biosphere reserve, bringing forward the importance of indigenous and local knowledge and practices. Our program is based on enhancing small scale beekeeping embedded in territories and relying on native bees. You know, women have a crucial role to play in communities through their beekeeping activities and for conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. We want to empower them by diffusing their stories and their good practices to the public and encourage girls and women to embrace scientific careers and pay their part in the ecological transition we need to accelerate. Once again, we all have a role to play and Guerlain is proud to do its part together with UNESCO. Thank you very much. Now we're going to start the conversation between some of our experts that have been working in the biosphere reserves and some of the women beekeepers that are practicing beekeeping in the different biosphere reserves. We're going to start now with the key question. Why is pollination important? So we, we, are, we have with us Hien Go. You are a biodiversity and pollination expert at the Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO of the United Nations. 
and you were also the head of the technical support unit for the IBES pollination assessment. So Yen, you're going to guide us through uh, pollination basics. What is pollination in a nutshell? What are the different types of pollinators and especially the role of bees in pollination? Uh, also the challenges related to the decline of pollinators and uh, how the program can help us face some of these challenges. Thank you very much, Max and Miriam and uh, others on the call. I'm really excited to be here uh, on World Bee Day. Um, and thanks again to the UNESCO uh, Man and Biosphere Program for inviting me to speak. So as Max said, I'll just uh, share a little bit of the basics before we get started. So let me just share my slides with you. Just a bit of the basics about what is pollination. Um, so most plants to reproduce, they have flowers with pollen. Pollination is when an animal visits a flower and they move that viable pollen from the anthers or the male part of the flower to a receptive and compatible stigma, the female part of the flowering plant. Then fertilization happens and then you get a fruit or a seed. This movement can happen between the anther and stigma of the same flower different flowers on the same plant self-pollination or different anthers and stigmas of different plants cross pollinators. So as you can see on the screen there, it's just a drawing of a bee doing the cross pollination. So Max has asked, uh, what are the types of pollinators that we have? So we have thousands of types of pollinators. The majority are insect pollinators such as flies, butterflies, moths, beetles, wasps, thrips, and yes, ants. There are also vertebrate pollinators such as birds, bats, rodents, like this cute possum uh, pollinator and lizards. But by and large, the largest group of pollinators are bees and why we're here today. So on the screen here, I'm showing you just a few of the managed bee species uh, that we have. So we have a mason bee, a leaf cutter bee, a bumblebee, and we have in the corner an Asian honey bee, just for as an example. But I want you to know that there are over 20,000 species of bees, an overwhelming proportion which are wild, and collectively with managed bee species, they play important roles in pollination all around the world. So I'll just give you a moment to look at the beautiful bees uh, all around the world. Max has also asked, uh, what are uh, the role of bees in pollination? So over 90% of all wild flowering plant species depend on some part on pollinators. These plants are really important for our ecosystems in terms of functioning. Uh, they provide food, as you know, they form habitats and they provide other resources to a wide range of species, not just to humans, um, more than three quarters of the leading global food crop types ex, uh, rely to some extent on animal pollination for yield and quality. Uh, pollinator dependent crops therefore make up about one third or 35% uh, of the global crop volume produced. Um, in addition to this, pollinator dependent food crops are very important contributors to human health uh, diets and nutrition. So all of the foods that we eat that have micronutrients, minerals, and vitamins such as fruits, vegetables, seeds, nuts, and oils are mainly pollinator dependent crops. Max has also asked about what are the major challenges related to pollinator loss and decline? So here I have on the slide some major drivers, although drivers vary from context uh, dependency to locations, to countries, to regions. But here on the slide are the, the major global ones. <clears throat> Habitat loss and homogenization, which really just means a decrease in land uh, diversity, landscape diversity. Uh, parasites and pathogens. We have chemical inputs such as pesticides, climate change, invasive alien species. Um, there are a bunch of other drivers that really threaten pollinator populations, including some indirect ones. And also please note some of these work together 
to really threaten bee populations. So they don't work in silos. And this is the dangerous part and why we should safeguard uh, a lot of our pollinators. Um, so I will stop sharing at that point. And then, so the last kind of question posed to me was about how this program, Women for Bees, can really help face these challenges. And although I am a big fan of the program and there are so many benefits coming out, I'll focus on two main ones. This program really empowers women through promoting local practices such as beekeeping. These practices can really support and improve livelihoods with producing honey, uh, pollen, wax from beekeeping. And having this source of income really decreases the vulnerability to poverty. This strengthens community ties through knowledge sharing and building a social network of community through beekeeping. So I almost think like the bees itself are a great model to what's happening in the community. You know, it's a hive within a hive because we share information and then we also work collectively towards a goal. And I think bees are a great model for that, uh, the social bees. And then secondly, and lastly, it raises awareness about uh, bees and other pollinators, which in turn will really maintain the population of local breeds and native species. So I'm excited to hear more about uh, the project as we go on and I'm very excited that this project has started. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yen. Uh, this is very, for, for the very nice account on pollination and your answers. So we're very happy to have with us uh, Ivana Kovacevic from the Kosiansko and Obsotelje Biosphere Reserve in Slovenia. Uh, who practices beekeeping there. Uh, can you, Ivana, can you tell us your experience and, and how you benefit from the program? Uh, yes, hello, my name is Ivana Kovacevic. Uh, I'm beekeeper and queen breeder from Kozjansko, Slovenia. I live in small municipality of Dobje pri Pranini, uh, in the center of Biosphere Reserve Kozjansko and Obstotelje, uh, which is part of the UNESCO World network of uh, biosphere reserves. I'm guardian of Apis mellifera carnica. My role is in beekeeping is sharing knowledge, uh, exchanging experience and uh, supplying beekeepers with genetic material. My goal is together with uh, local beekeepers to preserve our local bees. Natural resources of uh, the envi environment gives good conditions uh, for beekeeping with our authentic bee Apis mellifera carnica. Uh, meadow orchards and forests gives good opportunities for bees and other pollinators. Uh, Slovenian beekeepers are very lucky to have opportunity to work with our bee uh, carnica. It's very, very gentle bee. Um, and healthy with a lot, a lot of good qualities, uh, but that is not coincident. Uh, it's about centuries of uh, selection done by our beekeeping ancestors. Um, that's what we are trying to preserve and select for further generations. Beekeeping is my way of life and the way of life for, for more than 10,000 Slovenian beekeepers, men and women. This strong bond between bee and people manifests in many ways in the natural, cultural and social environment. Uh, being part of Women for Bees program will help, help to upgrade our efforts to preserve our, our bees. Bees and other pollinators, they are key to biodiversity and they are very crucial for a healthy and sustain sustainable environment, uh, which we must take care of. Uh, and that can be achieved only with, uh, by connection, uh, connecting and cooperation, uh, cooperation between local people. By exchanging experience for women be uh, with women beekeepers from other map reserves, will enrich awareness of imp importance of bees and other pollinators. Uh, the bees and other insects created uh, this world, this world of flowers, our world. Uh, but yet we know so much, so, so little about them, about this creation. 
I'm honored to get involved as Slovenian beekeeper, a woman beekeeper in UNESCO's Man and Biosphere program. And I'm thankful for the opportunity to be a messenger of Slovenian beekeeping tradition. And uh, for the end, one beekeeper told me once, bees sting hurts just for a while, but love for bees stays forever. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ivana. And now we also, we're also very pleased to have with us Patricia Vringo, uh, who also practices beekeeping in the Kozjansko and Obsotelje Biosphere Reserve in Slovenia. So we will hear from you now, uh, Patricia. Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Patricia and uh, I wish you a really happy, happy World Bee Day. Um, yes, I don't have as much experience as Ivana, um, but uh, I am at the beginning of my journey as a beekeeper and I'm also one of the participants in uh, this Woman for Bees project. So um, I look at the bees in a different way, probably because of my work background, because I, I uh, do mainly work in um, um, in uh, wellness and the uh, well be well-being of uh, our customers. So when it comes to bees, um, my main concern is their well-being. Uh, so for me, it's very important that uh, my bees are a happy, a happy bunch. Uh, so uh, when you have uh, a well-sustained uh, uh, bees, then you can take part of uh, their crops and uh, actually use it to uh, to benefit uh, that can benefit uh, the human uh, life. Uh, this is uh, in one way called apitherapy, and we can use different uh, bee products from bee venom to uh, apilarnil to apitoxin and um, honey um, and etc. Uh, for that, um, a lot of knowledge was gathered in the folk medicine about the beneficial effects of um, bee products. But now, well, for decades now, there is also a science backup. So it's not only folk tales, it really works. And we have the background that we need that um, this can get bigger, bigger and we can talk about api medicine, actually. In Slovenia, we have um, done some research, especially with the honey, uh, honey uh, wraps for open wounds, so um, and some others. But this was the first step, let's say, that uh, official medicine actually got a part of uh, api therapy. So in Slovenia. If we take aside all the science, um, we have, there are another ways to benefit from the bees. We have a tradition in Slovenia, which is called the uh, Panska Konchnica, and it's actually uh, a creative interaction with the bees where you uh, paint the front panels. It's like you are decorating their homes. Um, and, um, it is a thing that you, it shows that you can connect to bees in a different way. It's not, it's a, it's a mutual relationship. It's not a one way road and uh, the day will just go, yeah, okay, we will cooperate with you. And um, there are, there is another very special tradition in Slovenia, which are bee uh, houses. Uh, we have all our hives usually in one house, which is also usually very nicely painted. And uh, there you have um, uh, an opportunity that you can experience the buzzing of the bees, let's say, or you can just uh, look at them and uh, watch them going in and out of the hive, which is which has um, 
relaxing effect on people. I haven't noticed any researches done on the, their frequency of, uh, uh, of their buzz, but there is something in there. And uh, also you can get um, from a healthy point of view, you can get a, a honey massage in the beehive, in the bee house, or uh, maybe uh, honey thermal um, patches and so on. So there are a lot, a lot of opportunities where we can cooperate with the bees for mutual benefit. But for that, we have to take good care of the bees. It's not it's our responsibility they know what they have to do and they do it very very well but we have to keep that in mind that we also have to step up our game and uh, take care of the environment so that the environment will take care of them so i'm really really pleased and thankful to be a part of this program because uh as a beginner a beekeeper, um, you have quite a few challenges up your road, especially in the first two years. And for me, I really um, am looking forward to meet um, uh, other women beekeepers from other biosphere reserves, uh, just to uh, share the knowledge, to see what they are doing and how are they doing it and to, to see what can we do together to make this place a better place for the bees and for us. Thank you very much, Patricia. Thank you very much to both of you. We are very happy to have uh, today the both of you that are part of this uh, amazing uh, network. And there are more beekeepers that uh, UNESCO is going to be very pleased to to present you in the coming months and in the coming years within this program. And we are also particularly pleased of this conversation between the researchers, the scientists and the local practitioners. This is at the heart of UNESCO, especially also to acknowledge and to recognize uh, the local cultures like Patricia has, uh, has presented to us. Uh, with the disconnection between humans and the other living species, which is at the heart of the MAP program, this reconciliation, this respect, mutual respect, this recognition of the interdependence that we humans have with the other living species. And also, uh, it's very important for, for UNESCO in this perspective that for the first time, the tree beekeeping culture between Poland and Belarus was inscribed on the representative list of the intangible cultural heritage of humanity. So we hope also in this program and with all the women beekeepers that are going to join the network, uh, that we are going to be able to valorize your know-how and expertise. And you can see already with only two um, spokesperson or two ambassadors, Patricia and Ivana, the wealth of experience, of knowledge, of um, know-how and of connections that we can have uh, together with the pollinators and in the bees in that context. What I, uh, I would like to, to now give the floor to, um, to a um, very important uh, person that has been helping us in, in the start of this program. We have uh, done feasibility surveys in the different biosphere reserves um, to make sure that um, we address the key questions of beekeeping practices with local breeds, and species of bees, uh, the status and trades of native bee population, the impacts on climate change, on biodiversity, on bee production, but also the opportunities and challenges. So uh, we have done this feasibility survey. Today, you're going to hear about one of them in China, in Xixiangbuana Biosphere Reserve. The research has been done by uh, Ms. Jiaoyui Li, She's a trained environmentalist anthropologist, and now she's a postdoctoral research fellow at the Institute for Environmental Science and Technology at the Autonomous University of Barcelona, Spain. But she's actually in China. She has just finished uh, some field work in the Biosphere Reserve. So we are very happy to have you today with us. And her current 
research includes how climate change has affected the tea management and wild foods collections among Aka people in Southwest China. We are very happy to have you, Jiao, uh, with us today. And uh, we would like to ask you some questions that are going to echo uh, the testimony that we have heard from, uh, from Yen and, and Ivana and Patricia. But I would like first to ask you, uh, what does, you have worked in this uh, biosphere reserve, Shikshang Buana, and I'm sure you're going to pronounce it better than me. Uh, can, can you share with us what makes it unique, please? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Miriam, uh, and thank you for having me here. Um, I think to answer your question about the unique of the Xishuang Bana bio, uh, Biosphere Reserve, I think the most prominent and the core feature of the XBR is the biocultural diversity it, uh, it presents. So there are about uh, 13 ethnic groups living in the region, and the landscape covers from uh, you know, tropical rainforest, uh, agroforest to terraces, which all host uh, the richest flora and the fauna across China. I think that's the uh, pretty much the core feature and the, where the uniqueness comes from of the XBR. Thank you. So cultural diversity, and how can you make the connection between this cultural diversity um, the diversity of the ecosystems and the beekeeping practices in this kind of broader landscape approach? Um, yes, so I think I would say um, that both commercial beekeeping and traditional beekeeping exist in, in the larger landscape at the XBR. Well, commercial beekeeping is uh, pretty much dominated by uh, beekeepers and the investors from, from the outside of the XBR, from like other provinces of China, and they mainly keep Western honeybees. Uh, well, I, uh, through this uh, field assessment, I have worked with uh, several indigenous groups at the XBR. Uh, they are still in large practicing traditional beekeeping uh, using log hives. So those log hives are made from uh, fallen trees or dead trunks. So they don't really cut off the living trees to make, uh, to make beehives, but uh, using the, the ones has already fallen or they have already died. And in terms of the, um, the sustainable aspect uh, of beekeeping at the XBR, uh, on top of this uh, very traditional uh, usage of log hives, uh, I, I would say it is also embodied in the way of harvesting. Uh, so across the biosphere reserve, uh, honey is only harvested from late April to early June. So it's like only one season uh, harvesting. And the locals always say, leave some honey behind uh, for bees to survive on and for bees to come back uh, the next year. So I think the, um, the traditional beekeeping um, by indigenous peoples at the Xifran Bana Biosphere uh, Reserve is a really key feature. Uh, and also I think it echoes with the theme of this um, uh, partnership between uh, UNESCO and Guerlain. Yeah. Thank you very much, Yao. Um, because it's your domain of expertise, can, can you tell us a little bit, uh, based on your survey and your work, uh, if there is a, how do the people that you've been uh, working with perceive climate change impact? Uh, on, on, on the production and if, uh, if it's affecting them already, if you have signals or trends or indicators, and if yes, how do they adapt? Um, yes, totally. Um, I think, um, I mean, the, the major bee species uh, managed, we say, I mean, we say managed, but they are wild. Uh, so the, the major bee species they manage at the XBR uh, by, uh, by the locals is the wild Apicirana, the Eastern honeybee. Um, well, throughout this field assessment, it is, uh, it is very obvious that climate change impacts are becoming very concerning to a lot of uh, local beekeepers. Uh, for example, people constantly 
cited the increasing uh, extreme weather events, uh, so such as cold waves. Um, so during the field assessment, which was uh, from December to early February-ish, um, there were two uh, cold waves which has directly caused the decline of, of the wild bee population. So a lot of bee died from this uh, very cold weather. And because of a lot of plants were coated by ice, so the bees couldn't even um, pollinating anything. And also people mentioned that because of the temperature increase in the recent years, and there's a, a growth of the wasps population, uh, so usually this is not really um, what we should be concerning about because uh, wasps are um, natural enemies to um, honeybees, but the growth of uh, wasp population really put a threat on the population of wild, of, uh, wild honeybees. It's becoming a even bigger threat uh, to the local population of honeybees. Um, well, in terms of this, adaptation, um, I would say from, from what people were telling me, uh, it's still in, in process. I would say they're still learning about the phenomenon. They're experiencing, I mean, a lot of weather extremes they have never experienced before. So they're kind of adapting, ad learning and trying to find ways to adapting to it. There's no like, um, uh, a fixed solution to those uh, irregularities and uh, unpredictabilities so far. That's fascinating. I hope that the exchanges uh, and, uh, and the mobilization of some expertise and knowledge and know-how in other biosphere reserves can, can help and that maybe we can address these issues uh, in this program too. That would be uh, absolutely um, uh, useful. Uh, let me finish with one key question. This is what is gathering us today, but can you explain to us uh, in your research uh, in this biosphere reserve in China, what is the role of women in beekeeping? And, uh, and in your, um, in your uh, research and in your work, how do you think the woman will benefit from this program? Uh, yes. So uh, from this uh, field assessment, I have worked with uh, three uh, indigenous groups, uh, the Akka, the Lahu, and the Jino people. Um, all of them have a very long history of beekeeping, um, but they also have a uh, very strong sign of uh, gender labor division. So, which is, uh, I mean, this is this has been carried down for centuries. It's not a new um, new thing. So, but there's no like taboo or something involved in in terms of this uh, gender division. So, it is rather uh, due to the uh, the high risk and the labor intense status of beekeeping. Um, I mean, for a high risk, I mean, uh, locals don't usually wear protective gears, or they don't have, uh, let's say, like professional equipment uh, for harvesting or for just managing the hives. Uh, so they usually just light a cigarette to disperse the bees from the colony. Um, so they don't have this uh, hats or uh, clothes on for, for harvesting uh, the honey. And for the labor intense, it's uh, mainly come, coming from the, uh, the making of the log hives, because usually uh, it requires a lot of labor work to cut off and to make the hives. Uh, so those are uh, traditionally man's job. But uh, I would say across this, uh, from this, uh, these interviews I've done uh, with women, um, they do play a very significant role in, in processing the honey, in filtering the honey later on. And also they're the ones mainly doing the trading of the honey. Um, so I would still say um, women do play a very important role in the whole uh, value chain uh, of the honey production uh, at the Xichuanbana Biosphere Reserve. And they are willing to uh, participate, participate more and get involved more 
in the beekeeping practice because uh, I mean, if they were provided by uh, professional equipment or uh, giving enough of training of the knowledge, uh, I think the, the level of willingness is really high. Uh, they just, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a traditional a, a labor division, uh, I would say. And also by providing them this opportunity, I think this, um, the partnership um, between the UNESCO and Guerlain really offers this uh, capacity to women who are willing to get involved and who are willing to participate uh, in the future programs. I think it's a, a very strong empowerment uh, of the indigenous women in terms of I mean, first of all, in terms of bringing in the cash income to the household. Um, and second of all, it's a, um, I think it's a, a kind of a step forward uh, for, indig for indig indigenous women and for indigenous pop uh, populations to, to rise up as well. So I think those are uh, my major points from this uh, field assessment. Thank you very much, Jiao, mm -hmm. for sharing your insights and results with us today for the first time. So we are very honored and grateful for that. And I indeed uh, hope that the program uh, is going to support uh, uh, women uh, and empower them. That's one of the goal and this, that is the impact we want to make. I'm going to open the floor. Uh, if any of you wants to ask a question to any of, of you, or if you want to, to share maybe uh, as a conclusion what you have learned today from each other, anyone, it's open if you want to raise uh, your voice. If not, yes, yes, please, Jiao, yes. So I, uh, thanks, Maya. I do have a question for Yan actually, because uh, this is actually from, from, from the uh, observations of my informants while I was doing the field assessment. So there's a, definitely um, the observation of the delayed flowering season or you know, early flowering season. So it's, it's not, well, I mean, Local people cannot really make direct association between this, uh, you know, the changes of flowering season of, of the flora um, with the production of honey, or you know, even with the uh, the honeybees population. So, is there any scientific, you know, uh, research have have been done on this uh, relationship between the flowering season and uh, the honey production or bee population uh, yeah. or vice versa. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks for answering your questions and telling us a little bit about the biosphere reserve. I learned a lot uh, when you were speaking and, and uh, yeah, this question about phenological mismatches has definitely been done. And um, it's, it'll be interesting to to know about different types of knowledge systems that actually record when things flower, because the local people know when things are supposed to flower, when things are supposed to get warm, the temperature increases, things like that, and also insect activity. So definitely there's some um, studies on phen phenologies and the mismatches between uh, bloom times. Um, the direct correlation of that to climate change is a little bit needs to be investigated more, but definitely uh, studies like that have been done and it, and it will uh, start to be a problem if climate change uh, continues to increase. And climate change is one of these drivers that exacerbates other, uh, other drivers. That's why I mentioned that the multiple uh, drivers is important, but um, in my opening, I also didn't mention, which I should have listening to all of you guys speak is that in the IPBES 2016 pollination assessment report, we also had a, a large chapter on the importance of pollinators and pollination, not just for food production, but for cultural aspects and non-monetary values. And, and thanks for bringing that to the highlight. Of course, UNESCO uh, really promotes this, uh, this uh, cultural aspect. And bees and pollinators are so important in inspiration 
in art, in honey massages, uh, as I found out, and uh, and obviously to indigenous and local knowledge, it's it's definitely a very important component. So i uh, very happy that this program takes together all of those aspects and is working with people like you and indigenous and local communities. So that uh, that's my answer. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. So we are very happy to have all of you uh, because all of you are part of this amazing network now, the beekeepers, but also the researcher, the scientist. We are very pleased at UNESCO that um, we're going to cooperate with the International Pollinators Initiative uh, between the CBD Convention and FAO that Yen is representing today, as well as um, with the European Commission um, that we are going to coordinate. We want to uh, multiply our impact and, uh, and make sure that we work together with all these initiatives. Um, I'm also booked for a massage in Slovenia. I think uh, there is uh, some of us that are looking forward to be able to travel again and to test those amazing uh, practices locally. So except, uh, expect more, uh, more visitors uh, in the coming days. Now, we have, as I mentioned earlier, uh, today was just uh, uh, an introduction to this amazing network and uh, and women that uh, that you have met live we have more to share with you upcoming will be uh, also um, sharing insights from the beekeeping practices in Tonle Sap Biosphere Reserve in Cambodia with Eric Guérin that has also done an amazing work there and we also would like to share with you in the coming weeks um, the uh, work that has been done in the CAFA Biosphere Reserve in Ethiopia and that you meet the beekeeper, uh, the woman beekeeper, and we will have regular meetings with all this network and share their knowledge, their expertise, their know-how, and, uh, and make sure that, again, we are using um, this program not only to reconnect um, and to offer a platform for cooperation, but also to completely change the narrative about our relationship as human with the other living species. And that's at the heart of UNESCO strategy and with our partner from FAO and the European Commission and, and with the help of the scientists and the experts like Jiao and the beekeepers. I hope that we can together create this movement that is going to really make sure that we address the concerns of the young generation and that we live and live together differently on this planet and that uh, through the biosphere reserves we can show that it's already possible to live in harmony with nature now we can do it and we can do that together now and i'm so happy that you were all with us today happy b day happy b day to all of you thank you very much to uh, Slovenia for putting the B on top of the UN agenda. Uh, thank you very much for Gerland to support women uh, in the world uh, and their connection with uh, nature. And thank you, Max, for helping me to uh, co-animate uh, co this webinar. This is the first, but definitely not the last. Stay tuned for more. Uh, happy B Day again, and uh, à très bientôt. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Bye, thank you. Thank you.